my guest tonight is one of Asia's most extraordinary women. At the age of 35, she was the first woman to head a Muslim state since Razia Sultana. I've often wondered about this woman, who ruled a country where politics is a single gender environment. I wondered about that proud, brave young girl who fought and faced her father's execution by a military regime and inherited a troubled legacy of tragedies and triumphs. What person has life made of her? I was privileged to find out in my rendezvous with Pakistan's former Prime Minister, Benazir Bhutto. I've wanted to meet you for many years, ever since I read your book, Daughter of the East. And I want to thank you for giving me this honor today. Thank you, Simi, for giving me the opportunity. There are many pieces in the mosaic of your life and personality that continue to intrigue me. And I want to talk to you about some of them today. Should we go right back to the beginning? Why not? We could do that. You've had a privileged life, in many ways an idyllic childhood, haven't you? Very much so. I look back and think the days of my childhood were the best days mm -hmm. of my life. Having the warmth and security of my father's love, being thoroughly spoiled and indulged. Very close to him. We were all very close to him. And I, as an eldest child, was even more. I can imagine. The house would fill with laughter. And I remember he'd be singing a song. It would either be Ke Sera Sera. <laughs> or it would be some enchanted evening, mm. and everybody would sing. Not that I could ever sing. I had a very bad voice. So what about your father? So, How did he sing? Well, whatever my father did seemed perfect to me, and I think to most children, mm. their parents seem perfect. And to most parents, their children mm. seem perfect. My mother used to say that if you all were little caterpillars, I would still think you were the loveliest things on the <laughs> world because you're my children. She said once a mother, a, uh, mother caterpillar was asked about her baby caterpillar and she said my baby has the best legs in the world <laughs> so that's parental love two brothers two sisters two brothers two sisters one girl one boy one girl Perfect. one boy people said my father got everything right <laughs> but uh, you were the eldest did you boss over them I was the eldest and I guess I was a little bossy <laughs> are there any dreams that your father uh, gave you for your future? I know from the time I was a tiny tot mm. that he thought Nehru was a very good speaker mm -hmm. and he thought that if Nehru's daughter was, could be in politics and then later on she went on to be Prime Minister then his daughter was going to come into politics too. It was very much his dream. How did the daughter feel about it? I wasn't too keen. I didn't like politics and I'd say no Papa I'm not going to go into politics and he'd laugh and say we'll see. So at 16 you left the family fold and you went off to Radcliffe. That's right. What were you studying? I studied comparative government. Mm -hmm. I actually wanted to do psychology. But then my father wrote a letter to the principal and said that we come from a political family and wouldn't it be nice mm -hmm. if she did comparative government. How did you fit into the new campus culture? You grew your hair long, didn't you? That's right. Everybody said I look like Joan Baez and I really liked that because um, she had a song called um, Money Can't Buy You Everything. Hmm. And that was my favorite song. As a graduation gift, your father gave you a yellow MGB convertible. Yes, right. a lovely little sports car. It was called NOK 900. And I think nine is my lucky number. Okay. And I just loved whizzing by in that. I could put the roof down, the convertible roof down, and the breeze would blow, and I'd drive at high speeds, and I'd never get caught by the traffic <laughs> wardens, which was rather nice. But tell me, do you recognize that girl today? No, I, she belongs to a distant past. Mm. Those days, I was free to be what I wanted. In your world of academia, what did you learn about Western-style politics? 
that you found very important? Well, I thought Western style politics was so different from politics back home. And I thought that people in my friends took their freedoms for granted. The very act of being free to go to a ballot box and to cast your vote, not to have anybody try and uh, manipulate the result of that ballot. I thought that was amazing. And, and everybody just took it in their stride. Whereas for us, even now, uh, more than tw 25 years down the line, they are still in my country forbidden fruits. I know in India you've had democracy, mm. but it's been a different story in Pakistan. But tell me, Benazir, could any university in the world have prepared you for what they had in store for you? It's difficult to say, but I am grateful to my education at uh, Harvard and at Oxford. At Harvard for enabling me to have uh, to see situations in a breadth, uh, larger perspective. Mm rather than in a narrow perspective. But I learned more from my father in the death cell than I could have ever learned in any university. I saw a man stare death in the face mm. and not flinch. Here people get worried when their property or their liberty is at stake. Mm. And here was a man whose life was at stake and he did not flinch. Your father was Prime Minister of Pakistan. That's right. And you were going to come back and join the diplomatic service. It would have all been perfect. In January 1977, you came face to face in Al Murtaza, your home, with a man who would so drastically change your life. Your father's army chief of staff, General Zia. That's right. What were your impressions of him that day? Can you remember? Well, I remember being very disappointed because I thought that army personnel or army chiefs were supposed to be soldiers with physical exercise, tall, broad-shouldered, athletic. Mm. Uh, and I saw this sort of short, squattish man who did not make an impression at all. So I was a bit disappointed when I saw him and I thought that he wasn't a very charismatic mm. figure. And this man just seemed so ordinary mm. that I never realized that he's going to have this extraordinary effect on my life and the life of my whole nation. Because six months after that meeting, his regime arrested your father? That's right. It was January 5th, 1977, when we were in Larkana mm. for my father's birthday. And my father didn't have to call elections for one more year. Mm. But he told all of us at night that at Al Murtaza that I've decided to call elections early. And then on July 5th, 1977, um, General Zia declared martial law and he took over and I had just been back in Pakistan for five days and I'll never forget that night as we huddled in the Prime Minister's house in my parents' bedroom. We didn't know whether we were going to live or die like Sheikh Mujib's family which had been slaughtered together. So it was a terrible moment and many times after that I heard that Zia regretted not having killed all of us that night. But I guess 
the time of death is written. But he laid out the scenario that would eventually lead to your father's death. That's right, very much so. My father asked me, what do you think General Zia will do? Mm. And uh, fresh out of college, silly and naive, taking people at face value. I said, oh, maybe he'll hold elections in three months and you'll win them. And he said, don't be silly. He would have never arrested me if he planned to hold elections and see me back as prime minister of the country. He'll never hold an election because he knows I'm going to win those elections. You never believed that he would actually assassinate your father, did you? Well, one hopes. I wanted to believe everyone who said to me that my father would live. My father kept saying that he will kill me. He, he felt that? Oh, yes, because he kept him in such terrible situation, in this squalid death cell, without even the basic amenities of life. He wanted to break my father before yeah. killing him. It was horrible, horrible. My father would say he doesn't want me to live before I die. And it was so true. He didn't want my father to even live in that squalid death cell, a decent life. And my father would say he'd never do this to me if he expected me to walk out of the death cell. Never. And it was true. My father had it so right. He just wanted to break my father. But I'm glad that he was unable to do so. I think he wanted my father to come crawling to him. Because Zia had said that politicians are like dogs. All I do is snap my fingers and they'll come with their tails between their legs. He might have broken many a politician, but not my father. But he said he would entertain a plea of mercy from the family or from... Oh, no, he never said he'd entertain a plea of mercy as such. Hmm. Um, people said that after the death sentence, you can still make a plea of mercy. But my father said, I don't want any of you making a plea of Why? mercy. He said, because he's made up his mind to kill me from the day he arrested me. And he just wants you all to crawl. And I don't want you all to humiliate me. Everybody has to die. And I'm at peace with my maker. I'm prepared to go to God. And I do not want you all to grovel. You did not believe right till the end that he would actually do it. You thought something would happen, some miracle would take place. Is that what you conveyed to your father? I kept saying, but Papa, how could you tell a person that, yes, I think you're going to die? No. How could one say to oneself that, yes, he can die? Of course, I hoped for a mir miracle. Mm. And then the world leaders were calling for clemency. Yeah. People in Pakistan were immolating themselves. Mm. So of course, I mm. hoped that some of these efforts would bear fruit mm. and that he would live. But from the first day, he felt mm. that Zia would not spare him. And he was reconciled to being murdered. I remember on March 18, 1978, when he was sentenced to death, he didn't want to go to the Supreme Court. He said, why continue with this farce? It is a farce. He's made up his mind. It's, a, it's not a trial of murder. It's murder of a trial. And then my mother and my lawyers, my, mother, my father's lawyers, they all came and said to me, you go, Benazir. He loves you. You go and tell him to fight before the Supreme Court. So then I went to him and I said, Papa, please appeal. Please, for all our children's sake, please appeal. And then he said, all right, mm. if you'll want me to appeal, but nothing will happen. Mm. I was in court with him when uh, the ballistic report came. There were these five confessing accused who said, three confessing accused who said, these are the weapons with which we killed the man. The weapons did not match the bullets that were recovered from the man. So we jumped with joy and we said, look, this proves that they're telling a lie. And he just shook his head. And he said, these people don't understand. This is not a trial. This is a farce. And it was, it was the grossest abuse of the judicial system. Mm. And that Molvi Mushtaq, he was full of hatred against my father. He could hardly contain himself. He would rewrite the testimony. The witness would be saying something in front of me. He would be dictating something else. And if he protested, he would shout and say, take them out of the room. It was awful. We were in the end in a police camp. We were, my father was once arrested in one city, mommy was arrested in another, and I was in Karachi, three different cities. My brothers and my sister were abroad. We had no contact with them, mm. no contact with other human beings. So it was a very, very difficult period, a very dreary period. On 3rd April, the regime called you and your mother to meet him together. We used to go separately, mm. and when they called us together, we of course suspected that they might be calling us for the last meeting. So we suspected that maybe this is it. And when he saw us both together, this is what he said. He said that both of you have come together. Is this 
the last meeting mm -hmm. and my mother said no because formally it was not the last meeting and I said yes and he said what do you all mean I said well they never bring us together mm -hmm. and then he called the jail superintendent and then the jail superintendent confirmed that it was indeed the last meeting that the black warrant had arrived and that he would be executed the following morning at 5 a.m. had only half an hour with him. We had only half an hour with him and whatever little uh, meager things we had with him he gave us back. He kept two cigars with himself. He had one cigar then and he said that I would have another cigar at night before they hang me and he said I would have a bath because I want to go to my maker fresh and clean and uh, he was smoking a cigar and I remember as a university student I had read about a man called Pancho Villa that mm -hmm. when he was a sa captured a Mexican revolutionary when he was captured he was smoking and the cigar never fell because he was so calm and I was watching in fascination as the cigar smoke the ash would gather and I thought how cool he is how calm he is I was shivering from inside mm -hmm. but I had to be brave and strong for him so for his sake I kept my emotions inside me and then when I wanted to hug him goodbye they didn't even open the prison cell that I should be able to hug him goodbye he who had brought back 90,000 prisoners of war from the camps of India with honor the military commander did not even open the cell door that his family should be able to hug him goodbye you didn't hold him I had to reach out through the prison bars but they did not open the prison cell. Anyhow, it was a nightmare. How, how did one say goodbye? How does one say goodbye? He said, goodbye till we meet again because we believe in the day of judgment and we believe that on the day of judgment we will all be reunited. And he was so calm. Uh, he said, don't worry. He was consoling us. Instead of us consoling him, he was consoling us. And he said, don't worry. My parents will be waiting for me. My father and my mother and my brothers will be there waiting for me to come. That this is just a temporal world. And everybody has to leave it and go on to another world. And somehow he made the other world sound so comforting that after that I never feared death because I always felt that he would be there waiting so I never feared it he didn't see your tears well I made sure I didn't cry and you turned around and walked away it was a horrible walk each step was so painful I wanted to go back and scream and try and force open the bars mm -hmm. but I had to walk and walk and just walk away And then we went back and we had to wait and we had to wait, totally cut off, not knowing what could happen. Because you, after you left him, you weren't sure. Well, we knew they wanted to kill him, but we were hoping that something yeah. would happen. Some miracle. Some miracle would happen. Mm. So it was an awful, awful day because night we expected the worst, mm. but we still hoped that something yeah. would happen. But you knew it was the countdown. It was literally the countdown because I remember thinking how many hours more and with yeah. each hour that passed I thought now mm. nine hours eight five two one it was awful I couldn't wait in the end I just couldn't I'd, you know you just didn't know what to do whether to jump up or what to do how did you know that it was over I think uh, when they came back and gave me the clothes we've been wearing you mean at the very end yeah and the morning I couldn't bear it you know thinking that they're snuffing out his life they're snuffing out his life but I hoped and hoped and hoped that something would happen and the finality of it was really the clothes without the man it was horrible just I'd seen him in those clothes less than uh, 24 hours earlier I think it was I'd seen this huge warm this warm human body and now they were just the folded clothes and that's when it struck me. 
It's as clear to me today, although 20 years have passed, as it was that day to Kurt when they brought his clothes to the Sehala camp. It's as clear. I remember. It was such a horrible murder that they did. After his death, they continue to keep you in jail for five years, sometimes even in solitary confinement. They were frightened of his support because he wasn't just an individual, he was a symbol yeah. for the people of my country. He was a symbol of democracy and to keep themselves in power, they kept persecuting us. They would not let my mother or me be free. Arrest, released, arrest, released. It was awful. It was just like living in a grave. We were alive and we were not alive. When you look back at those people who did all this to you, who killed your father, who jailed you, what do you feel about them? I feel pity for them, that they were such miserable souls. And I think they were eaten up by fear. You must have felt hatred. I felt anger at the injustice. Mm. And it was the anger that drove me to battle them. Mm. But when it was all over, the anger went. My father used to always say, don't be bitter. I do not want my daughter becoming bitter. I used to say, how can one not become bitter? He used to always tell me, if you become bitter at 25, what will happen to you at 50? You have to free yourself from the confines that they're trying to put around you. I freed myself. So you can forget that part of your past? I believe in God, I believe in the law of nature, I believe that everything comes round, mm. that if you do ill, it comes back. Divine retribution. Divine retribution. And then we who were not allowed to see my father's face by General Zia, when he died, his whole body was burnt and he did not have a face left for anybody to see. Mm. So everything that you do comes back and it's going to come back in this very life. Maybe in the other life too, but I haven't visited the other <laughs> world yet. But this world, I can say that it comes back. Everything. In August 1988, when General Zia himself died in an air crash, what were your thoughts at that time? I was 70 Clifton, mm. and we got a phone call from somebody. Um, and he said, you know, General Zia's plane has disappeared. He was flying over Bhavalpur, mm. and the plane has disappeared. So I thought he's flown away to India or Afghanistan. <laughs> so I said, yay, General Zia's plane has disappeared. <laughs> then later on, the idea came that, no, the plane has not disappeared. The mm. plane has crashed, and the man is dead. And I had this sense of relief, like this huge cloud of burden was lifting from me. Mm. But I was very conscious that there should not be any rejoicing. Yes because I felt that the physical death had, in a way, denied us a political victory over him, which is what I would have much preferred. But it must have taken a while to believe it. It was just unbelievable mm. that this person who had so dominated our lives for such a long period caused so much havoc that finally this man who had caused so much pain and grief and suffering had gone to meet his maker and to be answerable to him. It was a sense of relief of a burden mm. lifting, of a dark cloud rising. Mm. But after such an experience, it has to have had a deep effect on your psyche. It has to have had. Very much so. Mm. I go to the grave and I see the grave and it's like I'm again a 25-year-old child in Rawalpindi district jail. And maybe I'm insecure because of what happened. Mm. Maybe I'm a little bit uh, paranoid because of what happened to me. Uh, in the past. Mm -hmm. And that's why I was very happy when I finally was married and I had a husband because I felt that I have somebody to share my problems. In 1988, at the age of 35, you became the first woman to lead a Muslim state after Razia Sultana in the 13th century, Empress of Delhi. What were your feelings? Was there a sense of vindication? 
a tremendous sense of vindication for my, first of all, for my father and for all those who had lost mm. their lives in the struggle for democracy, but also a tremendous sense of vindication as a woman, that I am a woman who broke the tradition, the barriers of uh, male tradition in a Muslim society. Personally, what was it like for you? I walked on air. I walked on air. The carpet was red and there were all these guards in white uniform. Mm. And I walked on air and as I walked, the martyrs walked with me. I know it will sound strange to you. You might think that I'm dotty. But I just glided into the Ewan is Sadr. It was a wonderful moment of uh, vindication for the suffering, the pain, the loss. And then, of course, the next day, the hard realities came crashing down. Write in your views on this program at Come, let's talk, you and Star Plus. Benazir Bhutto went on to become the first woman to lead an Islamic nation, twice elected Prime Minister of Pakistan. But political power extracted its price from the Bhutto family as their lives shadowed the tragedies of a Greek drama. Tonight, I continue my personal rendezvous with the besieged daughter of destiny, Motarma Benazir Bhutto. in jail took away an important part of your youth from the age of 24 to 31 and you'd barely been out of prison for two years when you agreed to marry Asif Zardari. That's right. He walked into my life in a most traditional way mm. through my aunt with the approval of my mother with my sister and all my friends saying marry him say yes he's so wonderful he's so romantic he's so charming and he'll make you happy and I wondered Mm. Did he make me happy? And then I thought, well, why not? He seemed mm. so very charming. Mm. And he gave me a sense of protection, of security. You agreed to an arranged marriage. Aren't most marriages arranged? Somebody sets you up on a date. Yeah, but this was different because, I mean, people, people were surprised that you had agreed to it, considering you came from a liberal Western education and that sort of a thing. They didn't expect it, but I suppose you missed out on that time in your youth of meeting people. That's right. You can understand it because you're from the subcontinent. Yes. I missed out because I was in jail at the time when most of my friends were meeting people yeah. and getting married. And then I couldn't afford a scandal. Yeah. If I had gone out with any man, it would have been such a scandal. Yeah. And then my brothers got married and I realized that my father's mm. home was no longer my own home. Mm. Because the day comes when it is no longer his, but that of your brothers, mm. or rather of the brothers' family. So I decided that I also needed a home of my own. Sure. And in walked this charming stranger with the most dazzling smile. Really? <laughs> swept me off my feet. And in seven days you agreed to marry him. In seven days. 
and dozens of red roses and chocolates and marrons. <laughs> yes, I decided to marry him. He was so romantic. He gave me a ring with two hearts, a sapphire and a diamond heart mm -hmm. with the words, till death do us part, written inside it. And he said these were the words that the Austrian Habsburg prince said in Myling oh. when he proposed to Catherine Deneuve, I forget the, her name, when he fell in love with her. Mm. And apparently I had walked into the cinema to see Myling. Mm. And he was there at the same time when he first saw me and he remembered it. And it seemed very romantic. I'm sure a lot of men give women a ring with till death to us part, but it seemed very romantic <laughs> to me. But he had a polo playing playboy image. Did that deter you? No, I grew up in the East where we are told that yeah. most boys are playboys and you can't turn away because if you do, you don't know what they'll be up to. I like the fact that he played polo. I thought it was a very healthy sport. You put off meeting him for a long time, didn't you? That's right, because when he proposed in 1985, that was just before my brother Shanivas died. So when I when Shanavas died, I told my aunt, I said, I cannot meet him for two years because mm. I have to mourn my brother's death. And I couldn't believe it when in 1987 he was still around and wanted to meet me. And I said, who is this paragon of virtue <laughs> get, who can wait so patiently? So then I agreed to meet him. Was he aware of the responsibilities of marrying a person like you? Not at all. He thought that I'm never going to become prime minister. Mm. He said, this foolish girl, she thinks she can become prime minister of a Muslim country. She thinks the Muslim masses are going to vote for a young girl. She thinks the military is going to allow a young girl to come into power. She's mad. So he thought that, you know, he's coming, being very honorable, and he's saving me from my grand delusions of grandeur. <laughs> and he stepped in, and he got the shock of his life, and I became prime minister. He couldn't cope. He just could not cope, because he did not expect to be married to the prime minister of Pakistan. So how did he deal with it? Well, he couldn't deal with it, and it was very difficult for us. He said, I'm not going to live in Islamabad. I'm not the prime minister of the country. You are. You live in Islamabad. I'm going to live in Karachi. So he shifted to Karachi, and I used to visit him every weekend, or else he'd come and visit me on weekends. And we had this weekend marriage, which was rather difficult for both of us. And because he was away from the scene, people uh, started making up stories about him. What I mean is that in the society, people hate him yes. for being a man who walks behind a woman. And there's a lot of male rage directed against him by the traditionalists and the conservatives in our society, and it's not fair on him. I feel in some way responsible for his plight in the sense that he is a male who is married to the most powerful female in the country. He's a very brave man. He's broken the status quo. The first years were way tough. We've been married for 10 years, 10 and a half years, and he's been in prison for five of those years. Isn't that strange that the men in your life have spent so much time in jail? It is so strange. But all the men in my life have, uh, that I have known, from my father to my two brothers mm. to my husband, they have all suffered.
what did political power do to the Bhutto family in that sense? Because while your father was alive, it was one unit and together. But the moment power came, the moment you came into power, estrangements took place. The family seemed to get divided. What happened? When my father died, we were physically broken up. Mm. My brothers were living in uh, France or Syria. I was either in detention or in London, so we couldn't meet. Mm. And then we all got married. And ever since my brother Murtaza got married, somehow or the other, the relations were no longer the same. I think it was the marriages that led to the difference. The, I, I can't say. It wasn't political power. It was that the rallying point was my father and he was gone. And the chain of command that my father had set with myself as the eldest and the others following suit was not accepted by my mother and my brother after my father died. It was my father who always wanted to see me in politics. Mm. But after my father died, my brother and my mother said that it's the man who inherits, not the woman. You differed on the approach to, uh, to getting democracy. Oh, we differed in the approach, but it did not weaken our love for each other. Mm. I thought the only path of success was the peaceful uh, path and the democratic path mm. and uh, my brothers hid the fact that they had followed a violent path for a very long time and in the end my brothers did give up the path of violence mm. but unfortunately by the time my brother returned to fight on a democratic platform he took on the PPP because in 1993 he announced that he would contest the election that's right did he become a rival, a polit political rival for you? Very much so, because I asked him to contest on the PPP ticket. Mm. I told him that you can contest any National Assembly seat and any Provincial Assembly seat. Mm. But he said, no, I want to contest 17 National Assembly seats. I said, Meer, why? Mm. If you contest 17 seats, you can't keep them. You can only keep one. Mm. And that means in the National Assembly of 217, we'll be losing 17 mm. sure seats, because mm. you'll only be notified mm. from one. But no, he said, I want to fight, and if I don't fight these seats, declare me as chief minister. Now, we couldn't declare him as chief minister because he had a tag of being a terrorist. And it breaks my heart because my brother Muttaza mm. would have won with the largest majority in the history of Pakistan if he had fought on the PPP ticket. And instead, he won by a measly 1,200 votes with my mother going door to door campaigning for him. Why did your mother campaign for him? It was against you in that sense, wasn't it? Yes, that's right. Mummy campaigned for him because she suddenly felt that the boy should succeed and not the girl. Now, I had no problems with that if my brother could actually succeed and win, because I'd already been Prime Minister mm. one, and I didn't want to have this fratricide in the family. Mm. But he could not win. And I felt I couldn't let down my party. I could mm. give it up for my brother, but mm. I couldn't give it up for defeat. So mommy campaigned for him, but despite mm. that, he lost all the seats except one. And if he'd come back on the PPP platform, he would have had a reception bigger than the reception of Khomeini. When I met Mir in July mm. 1996, I said, Mir, why did you contest all those seats? He said, because my bodyguards told me that she won't give us seats. She'll only give you seats. What will happen to us? We are the ones who have faced the days of exile with you. What will happen to us? So for their narrow, selfish reasons, they made him contest those seats. But your, fa your brother would be that gullible that he would get... My brother was out of the country. Mm. He'd been out since 1977. 19 years he'd been outside Pakistan. There was a whole new generation. People who were children, who were 10 years old, were now 29 years old. Actually, 39 years old by the time uh, he came back. Mm. So he was totally cut off from the realities of Pakistani politics. And he believed the propaganda that if you have the Bhutto name, that's enough to win. Of course, the Bhutto name is a great starting point. Mm. But more than that, you have to be known to the people. And he was an unknown quantity because he had lived an underground life. I was a known quantity. On 3rd November, when Murtaza flew in to Karachi, you were prime minister at that time. And he was arrested at the airport. Why did you, why did you do that? It wasn't me. It was the law. Mm. In fact, Murtaza had been sentenced to several life prison, imprisonments. And my first term, I had had him given amnesty. Mm. and amnesty to everybody else. Mm. But once my government was overthrown, Nawaz Sharif had made another case against him, which was called the Shah Bandar case. And he had to go to prison because of that. So I begged him, I said, please come back before I become prime minister. Mm. Think what it will do to me 
that mm. I'm your sister, people won't understand it's the law. Mm. They'll think it's your sister, but he didn't come. And he felt that if somebody else came into government, he wouldn't be safe. Mm. But once Benazir is there, my sister is there, mm. then I will be safe. Then mm. I can go back. And that's why he chose to come back after I was sworn in. And it was very difficult for me because as prime minister, I couldn't intervene with the law. So did you meet him and talk to him when he came back? When no, happened. because when he came back, he was arrested. And then when he was freed, he put many conditions to meeting me, which were political conditions. And I could not, uh, I was not an empress. I was an elected prime minister, mm. answerable to a parliament and to a party. Mm. But throughout, my mother, my sister, and other political associates all did their best to try and bring about a rapprochement. Mm. But each time, it was his bodyguards who would not let him meet with me. So they were the stumbling block, and I wish I had been able to recognize that it mm -hmm. would be difficult for him to dump them, but he was fiercely loyal to them. But you know, see me, mm. I think it was more, I think he took on his older sister. Mm -hmm. And when he lost, he couldn't look me in the face. And I hate saying this, mm -hmm. but I really felt it was his pride that came in the way. If he had won, it would have been different. Mm -hmm. But having taken on your sister and having lost, it was so much more difficult. It was a man's pride, that ego that also came in his way. I think uh, your mother, Nusrat Bhutto, could have done something. Yeah, unfortunately, mommy was falling sick. And not only that, first I felt betrayed by her because she campaigned against mm. me. Then Meer felt betrayed by her because as soon as the election was over, she moved into the PM house. So Meer felt that, mommy, you worked with me, you supported me in what I was doing. Now that we've lost, how can you just move into the PM house? Why did she do that? She supported the son, but it hadn't worked, and so she moved in with the daughter. So Meer felt let down. But for us, the tragedy was that none of us knew that mommy was falling ill. Her memory was not so good. How old is she? Mommy's 70. That's not very old. Then. No, it isn't. But then what, what you all have been through is different, I suppose. It's so sad what's, what's happened. You know, I look at her. She's my mother, and I think here's this lady. She was the first lady of Pakistan, and she was the most glamorous first lady, and I used to live in fear of her. Mm. And now it's like she is my mother, but at the same time, she's so dependent. A time comes in people's lives when children become their parents. In that sense, political power has become like a curse to the Bhutto family. It's claimed your father, two brothers, your husband in jail, first for corruption and extortion, now for the murder of your brother, Murtaza. Well, I just think it's shocking what's happened. My husband has been holed up on charges of killing my brother, mm. which is so absolutely grotesque and gruesome and painful to me. I hate politics. I always hated mm. politics. But somehow it's made me its prisoner. The more I run from it, the more it puts its tentacles around me like some sort of an octopus and binds me down. I always used to think that my father will be free. I used to dream of the day he'd be free and I'd forget about politics. And each time it's like quicksand, you know. It sucks me down and it pulls me down and I, I just don't know. I've never 
liked it. I've always hated it, mm. but I've always had to do it. I've had to do it because of my obligation to my party and to my people. I would love to see the end of Nawaz Sharif's rule, put my country safely on the path of democracy and move on. But somehow we are caught in a time warp. It's widely believed that your husband Asif benefited disproportionately while you were prime minister. My husband was tried for these uh, charges in my first uh, tenure as mm, opposition leader right. and he was honorably mm. acquitted. Now he's being tried again. It's so unfair. He was called Mr. 10% or Mr. 20%. How did these labels come on? From my opponents, my political opponents to detract attention from their own corruption and their own ill deeds started calling my husband Mr. 10%. Apart from Mrs. Thatcher, you're the only Prime Minister who has a husband. Considering the way we are brought up, traditionally, how the Eastern woman is brought up, is there ever a conflict between being a strong leader and being a loyal wife? Samia, I can tell you this, that my husband has never come to me and said, Benazir, I want you to help me with this contract. But could he have the clout to do it on his own without asking you? How would he have the clout? Because in Pakistan, because your husband? In Pakistan it's not a dictatorship. You don't just ring up a secretary and say, I want this done. In Pakistan, you have a specifications committee that draws up the specifications. Mm. Then you have a, a committee that does advertisements. Then you have tenders. There has to be a contract. Every single contract in my time was a contract which was tendered, mm. in which there was an auction. The prime minister does not give contract. He's been totally honest with you, has he? He has been totally honest with me. I think he's been totally honest with me. I think he's a good man. I think he's a misunderstood man. I married him before I became prime minister. I know him as a successful businessman. He was in construction. Mm. His and people who are in real estate and construction make a lot of money. Yeah. And he's not like Mr. Nawaz Sharif or others mm. who had no businesses of their own mm. and who went into politics to make a business. It could not be that you were the last to know or you could be the last to know. But is there anybody who knows? He's never been convicted of anything. There are five cases against him which rest on one set of documents which have been fabricated by Senator Sefer Rahman, the Ethisab Bureau, and the Prime Minister's mm. Secretariat on the orders of the Prime Minister. These papers have a linked document called a mandate agreement. That mandate agreement is a forgery. I put this to you because if you take away that linked document, there is no evidence. If there was irrefutable evidence against him, what would you do? If there was irrefutable evidence against him, I'd come to the public and I'd say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that this mistake has happened. I hope you will forgive him and I hope you will forgive me. But I know that there is no irrefutable evidence because he's not done anything wrong. And all we are asking is that give us a fair trial. If there was an iota of truth mm. to these charges, the regime would have been very happy to have televised our proceedings. We mm. have asked for them to be televised. Oh. And they've refused. But tell me, do you meet him? Yes, I meet my husband. I meet him uh, once a week when I can. Because when I am uh, in Pakistan, he's in three different cities with three different trials. He's suffering from spondylitis. He's been kept in solitary confinement. He's had to fight even for his medical treatment. The government has gone all the way to the Supreme Court of Pakistan to oppose his medical bail. How is he holding up? He's a very brave man. Keeps smiling. He's got such a lovely smile. And he always smiles. And you know, it, it hurts me to see him suffer like that. Although he's so much stronger than me in that sense. He says, don't worry. It doesn't matter. And again, he's the one who consoles me. I get angry at the injustice. But he doesn't even get angry at it. He says, that's the way they are. It's part of life. Accept it. Why do you waste your anger on them? Mm. I do feel angry. I hate leaving him. I hate it when I have to say goodbye to him, then I go and see him in the prison cell, or now when he's in hospital and we have to get up and we have to leave, and whenever we meet, it's being taped and everybody is watching us. And I just think this is, there's got to be more to life than this. And then I say that tragedy and triumphs are both sides of the same coin. You want the triumph, you have to have the tragedy. You've got to pay the price. What have you told your children about him? I have told uh, children that your father is an honest man and a brave man and that your father is being punished by fanatics and zealots who hate your mother 
because she's a woman who wants to transform Pakistan mm. from a backward, conservative, rigid society mm. into an enlightened, progressive, forward-looking nation. That's what I've told them. I said, they're women haters. They hate your mother because she's a woman, and they're making your father pay for it. My little daughter says to me, when is Nawaz Sharif going to jail? <laughs> so, I mean, it's tough. It's tough on the children. But they know in he's Pakistan. in jail. They know he's in jail, very much so. My daughter was, when she was six and I was taking her to jail, she, I didn't tell her we were going to jail. Mm. She said, oh, we're going back to Landi jail. And I said, how do you know? She was two when her father had gone to jail previously. Mm. But she remembered, you know, this goes down into the minds of children mm. and they really remember. And the boy, he's so sensitive and withdrawn and he cuddles up to his father. He clings to his father every time we go and see him. Because of the tragedies that you've been through, because of your years in prison, fighting the military regime, you had been elevated into, in people's eyes like a saint. The fact that you are having to fight corruption charges, there is that sense of disappointment, there is disillusionment in a sense, there is sadness. Yes, I know what you're trying to say. I agree with you that there is a sadness, because now I've been in politics for 20 yeah. years, and when you throw a lot of mud, some of it sticks. sticks before I was untried, yeah. so people had a, a, a pure image. And then when you're in government, you do some good and you make some mm. mistakes. And when I see that sadness, I want to tell the people, please don't be sad. Mm. Please don't, because some of what you've heard is true, some of what you've heard is not true. Mm. And what you've heard is true, well, we'll make amends. And what you've heard is not true, give a person benefit of the doubt. Are you carrying the baggage of the previous generation in your feelings towards India? I want to make it clear that I don't hate India. I'm excited by the thought of India. My mm. mother's mother is buried in Bombay. It's just that there has been a problem about Kashmir. And many people in India may have misunderstood our feelings about Kashmir. In a sense, I feel that women leaders, we felt we had to measure ourselves by male leaders. So each one of us, including me, mm. felt we had to be more warlike, more militaristic, and more aggressive than mm. our male counterparts. Yes. Because in some way, if we were not more warlike, we would not be proper leaders. Mm. And I think coming of age for me has been to realize that people look to us, us because we are not warlike, because exactly. we are nurturing, right. because we are peace-loving. And that's the sort of symbol that I would like to be of peace and rejuvenation rather than destruction and tension. If a crystal ball could tell you the truth about anything you'd like to know about yourself, your life, your future, what would you like to know? Well, I wouldn't like to know it's not good. I don't mean the crystal ball is dangerous because you don't know what the crystal ball would show. But if I had a wish to make, mm -hmm. I'd wish for stability in my life. I'd wish for no more heartaches for no more tragedies. That's what I'd wish for, because there's been enough of tragedy, too much tragedy. And sometimes I wonder, you know, sometimes I feel that my shoulders are too frail to have carried as much tragedy as they have. Your father said that what you make of your destiny is up to you. From my side, I wish you peace of mind, happiness. I want to thank you so much for giving me this interview. Thank you very much, Sidney. You've been marvelous. Thank you for this rendezvous. Thank you, Sidney.